Welcome to the Grand Prairie City Council meeting for Monday, October 5th, 2020. We will start our city council meeting as we always do with our national anthem. Uh, our home and native land, true patriot love in all of us command. With glowing hearts we see the rise, the true north strong and free. From far and wide, O oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. God, keep our land. Glorious and free, O oh, Canada, we stand on God for thee. O oh, Canada, we stand on God for thee. Thank you to the National Film Board for the images of our country and to an alumni of our very own Grand Prairie Boys Choir for the audio. Uh, we will start our council meeting with adoption of previous council meeting minutes. Councillor Minhas. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Gibbon. I move the council adopt the minutes of city council meeting held Monday, September 21st, 2020 as presented. Okay, thanks very much, Councillor Minhas. Are there any errors or omissions? Uh, anything that we need to change before we adopt them? Councillor Thiessen. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Given The only thing I noticed is in the roundtable section, uh, I believe uh, it said that I gave an update on uh, the Grand Spirit Foundation. I believe that's supposed to say Peace Library Systems. Uh, just a simple like typo of that. Uh, but as much as I'd like to say I was at the meeting, uh, at the last council meeting, I can't let that stand because I was not. Thank you. Thanks for that catch, Councillor Thiessen. Uh, we'll get that adjustment. Were there any other errors or omissions that we need to catch before we adopt that set of minutes? Seeing none, then I will call for the vote. All those in favor? Uh, yeah, okay, so this is our first time having this many people back in council chambers, sorry. <laughs> Everybody's going, well, wait a minute. So you see, okay, uh, so what we will do then uh, is we will actually do the vote on our devices in council chambers that will show on screen and uh, Councillor Blackburn I'll ask you uh, to raise your hand. Uh, so I will we'll call for the vote uh, in council chambers. Please vote. Thank you and Councillor Blackburn how do you vote? Sorry in favor. Okay. Thanks, Council Blackburn. I have eight votes uh, cast here, uh, and those votes are all in favor as well, so that motion passes unanimously. Um, thanks, yeah. Council Blackburn. So, Council Blackburn, I think that's what we'll do is after I see a total of eight votes cast, then I'll come to you and ask you how you vote, and then I'll display the in-council chambers votes. <laughs> okay, good. We got that out of the way. Uh, our next item was the special City Council meeting minutes. Councillor O'Toole. Thank you very much, Mayor Gibbon. I move the council adopt the minutes of the special city council meeting held Tuesday, September 22nd, 2020, as presented. Okay. Thanks very much, Councillor O'Toole. Any discussion or debate on that set of, set of minutes? Any errors or omissions? And seeing none, then I will call for the vote in council chambers. Please vote. Thank you. And Councillor Blackburn, how do you vote? In favor. Thank you. And that motion carries unanimously. Okay, uh, next we'll go to the adoption of the agenda. Councillor Bressy. Great, thank you, Mayor Given. I would move the council accept the agenda as presented, but with the addition of item 7.1, Community Knowledge Campus Advisory Committee. Okay, thanks very much, Councillor Bressy. Any discussion or debate on the agenda as recommended? With that addition, again, seeing none, I'll call for the vote in council chambers. Please vote. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Blackburn, how do you vote? In favor. Thank you. And that motion passes unanimously. Okay, this has been good so far. These unanimous votes are a good way to get started. <laughs> Hopefully that gives us a little practice where we maybe get some mixed ones later on. 
Um, so the next up is our uh, open delegation portion of our agenda. This is one of two opportunities that people have to speak to City Council. We did have one delegation let us know that they wish to present uh, this afternoon, uh, rep representatives from International Coliseums Company. I believe this is uh, Mr. LaForge and Mr. Kozabak. Um, if I could ask you gentlemen to both turn on your cameras and microphones, uh, we would invite you to join us at the council table digitally, I suppose. Uh, hello, Rick. And uh, if your partner, Mr. LaForge, is there. Yeah, uh, let me just see what happened there. There we go. Well, we've got, we've got audio for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just trying to get uh, the, the uh, camera up here. Give me a second, then I'll restart this. Uh, Rick, maybe if you want to introduce your group a little bit while uh, uh, Patrick's sure. getting his technology arranged, and, and don't worry about that. We uh, all have had our technology challenges in this new environment, so um, mm -hmm. we can roll with the punches there. But yeah, if you'd like to introduce sure. yourselves. Sure. Now, I don't know whether Arlene is, uh, or someone will, will put up her PowerPoint up on the screen for me to share, or is that, am I getting this? The uh, the screen now, Arlene. We, or, we can or, give you screen share. Okay. Uh, and there we go. The is fine. So, Arlene, were you? I think I had sent the PowerPoint uh, for someone else to kind of put up on the screen, but I don't know whether that's the case or not. So I'm going to use the one I have. Hopefully it'll come true for you. Looks like we're okay. I can, might have a little bit of a time delay mirror on mine. Um, again, I'm, uh, there okay. we go. Looks good, Rick. Well, I'm trying to get my uh, trying to get my uh, from the beginning here, but maybe let me try this. Uh, uh, there we go. There we go. I think I've got it now. Can everybody see this? I'm sorry for that. No problem. No problem. We can. Here, but hopefully we're good. Okay. Great. Well, Mayor and members of council. So thank you very much uh, for giving Patrick and I an opportunity to uh, to speak to you today. I know you've got lots on your agenda. We won't keep you too long. We just uh, we were approached a little while ago by some local businessmen who uh, wanted to get some ideas from us on on the development of sport and entertainment facilities uh, in the advent of things that might or might not be happening within the city of Grand Prairie and or county. So. Uh, we took that opportunity to, to connect and um, and thought that, uh, maybe this was an opportunity for us to speak to all of you uh, just with regards to uh, some of the things that we have uh, as a company here. So what I, what we did do is just put together a, a little bit of a, of a PowerPoint demonstration for you on our, our company, a little bit of history and some of the thoughts we have on the development of projects like this in municipalities similar to Grand Prairie. Uh, so we're going to kind of cover the introduction to some development ideas, talk about entertainment centers and, and entertainment districts specifically, uh, give you some thoughts on site options and how we as a company help municipalities such as yours uh, identify the appropriate site, uh, talk about some costing and ways to minimize and mitigate costs, uh, uh, and then give you some samples of, of a couple projects that are very similar uh, to things that might happen in the Grand Prairie area um, and, and some ideas about how we help those municipalities with their conceptual planning at the very beginning. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass this over to my colleague, Mr. LaForge, to, uh, to start us off. Patrick? It's interesting, Rick. You're in Shalane, Washington. I'm in Edmonton, and we're speaking to people from Grand Prairie. How good is that? It's all good. Uh, thanks, Grand Prairie Council, for allowing us to share some information with you today. Uh, quick background, uh, Rick and I go back many years. He was a uh, founding partner in a couple of professional hockey leagues and uh, was a senior guy in the Boston Pizza development, the development of Boston Pizza Company. 
which uh, were a group of guys that started ICC, uh, Jim Treliving and George Melville. My background goes to uh, Molson Breweries uh, for a number of years. My first event ever, I was in the event business for 15 years there and beyond. First one was the Canadian Hot Air Balloon Championships in Grand Prairie, Alberta uh, in 1980. And uh, you know, since then, lots, of ha lots has happened. But uh, I was in the concert business. Molson Concerts International was the prelude to Live Nation. Uh, which is the world's largest today, but probably not much in the cash register. Molson Indy, which we started in Toronto, Cops Coliseum, Hamilton, and a number of other facilities. And then uh, Alpine Canada doing outdoor events with the Canadian Olympic Association and the Oilers uh, for 15 years, and then Oilers Entertainment Group. Uh, I was a governor and uh, with the NHL, the Western Hockey League, the American Hockey League, uh, uh, sort of the guy that came up with the idea for the first outdoor NHL game in 2003. And I spent about 10 years developing the, the dream of Rogers Place into a facility and then the Ice District. So a lot of experience in facilities and facility development. Uh, along the way, I was a uh, long, long serving governor of the Western Hockey League and brought the Edmonton Oil Kings from back to existence in Edmonton. I've known and worked with Rick, as I said, for many, many years. And uh, we go back on this. Uh, we worked, started to work together about six years ago on, on developing a similar concept and project for the city of Fort McMurray, which I'm sure you've heard of. And uh, we worked on it together and we actually were very successful in getting it done, but fires and flooding all followed and who knows where it is today. Rick? Great, thank you, Patrick. Um, I, I, my name is Rick Kozebeck. I am the current president and CEO of uh, International Coliseums Company. And as uh, Patrick mentioned, our company has been around for 20 years. It was started by Jim Treleving and George Melville of Boston Pizza Notoriety. Uh, it was an adjunct company to the Central Hockey League that we also started as a group uh, with George and Jim at the helm in 1995. So we originally formed the Pro Professional Hockey League and then five years down the road formed this company to basically follow the Boston Pizza footprint of uh, we can sell you a franchise, we can build you a store, we can put you in business and hopefully help you be successful. So uh, that that was the genesis of the company. I, I am a, uh, a former peace country resident. I was born and raised in, actually born in Grand Prairie, raised in Rycroft and uh, went to school at the University of Alberta before resettling in Penticton uh, and was uh, one of the partners and owners of the Okanagan Hockey School in Penticton Knights uh, back in the uh, 70s and 80s. Um, in, in addition to Patrick and, and, our, and myself and our companies, when we uh, do work for municipalities, we spend a lot of time working with our teammates, uh, in, in particular our architectural and engineering firms is an international firm called Perkins and Will, the Vancouver and Calgary offices. We work specifically out of the office of, in Denver, which is a sport and entertainment venue office. Um, all of the buildings you see up on the screen here, with the exception of the one in the far bottom right here, um, we did in conjunction with Perkins and Will uh, over the years. Uh, the one in the bottom right is Erie, Pennsylvania, which Patrick's familiar with. Um, uh, the Erie Otters uh, of the OHL are, are a team there, and uh, Perkins and Will did that one, which is a renovation project, actually. The other firm that we work uh, closely with on projects of, of uh, significance like this is a Toronto company called Sierra Planning and Management, who do feasibility and economic development work uh, with us. Patrick? Yeah, uh, so uh, getting started quickly, uh, the history or the, act, uh, the way these uh, kind of roll out is um, you survey the community to establish a level of interest, uh, interest in a vision. Uh, the vision is, you know, we work together with communities to build and, and craft the words around visions. Um, uh, entertainment facility, entertainment, because it crosses over so many different lines from car shows and bull sales to indoor rodeo to potentially hockey and, and of course, live entertainment uh, for all in 100, 150 nights a year. Uh, there's a lot of different stakeholders involved in these uh, kind of concepts and all the ones that you've seen here uh, in this case, 
um, uh, in uh, Pitts Pittsburgh, in Pennsylvania, the PPL Center, and down on the left, you've got Winnipeg's MTS Center, right downtown on in the old Eaton's building site, and uh, bottom right is the design concept that was approved for Fort McMurray. A um, lot of stakeholders involved, and we'll get to that down the road here, but um, start to understand uh, the level of interest in live entertainment and other things. And then we put together the size and scope of a draft and start looking around for footprints where it could be available with the amount of land available. And so in Edmonton, even though we were downtown development, we looked at, uh, we wanted to be downtown and, and municipal government wanted us to be centered in a place that it could be turned into a district. We started with 30 acres of land there and uh, that was abandoned CNR land from back in the early 80s and uh, was privately held, but we, we assembled with the city and others options on that land that gave us access to about 30 acres. And so we could move it around that, but there was a lot of interest in other sites and other locations. And uh, again, this is, it requires some dialogue. The size and scope of the project has a lot to do with, uh, I, I quickly looked at 150 shows a year, 150 nights of entertainment in Grand Prairie is about a million traffic, 6,000 seat, uh, seats. It's not a very much to sell in the market the size of 150,000 people or more uh, when you consider a vision of a hub city for Northwest Alberta. And, um, it's uh, it, that, that, that in itself, so okay, what do you do with a million people? What do they do other than just sit in the seats? Obviously, there's a long list of things that go on there, and that builds into the site options. Well, we, I don't think there's anything here that you probably all haven't heard before as, as representatives of the city of Grand Prairie and, uh, and, and of being around development for, I'm sure, the many years you have. but. You know, we, we look at, at basic requirements of what, what, is, what is required. What is the programming needs of a municipality? What is it that we're looking for? And in most cases, what we try to help municipalities do is look at a multifaceted approach to a facility. And I think that's what Patrick's allude, Patrick was alluding to here earlier, is, is when you decide to go down the road of potential development, be that a renovation or new or new development in new properties, you, you look at what's this thing going to be able to do for us in the next 50 years. Um, we look at preferred locations. You know, what are what are the, the best locations for a project that will signify and solidify our community for the next 30 to 50 years? Because that's the lifespan of what we're dealing with here. And how is that community going to grow? How would it, will it envelop? And how will it make uh, this particular location the location of choice? Um, you look at, at possible, you know, site costs, um, which are always an, an important consideration. Does the city or the county own property that can be part of a of a deeded opportunity to the project? Uh, is the property that you might be looking at that's the most favorable? Is is that owned by private individuals? Is there a cost to that? Uh, what is that cost? How does that relate to the overall cost of the project, which is the design, build, and operate? So what are the development costs? You know, is the site needed to be excavated? Do we need to build the site up? Do we have a water table issue? Are, are we close to other kind of ingredients that would make the site more attractive? What are the infrastructure costs? I mean, are, do we have utilities close to the site? Do we have to bring utilities from a distance? Those are all things that we take into account when you look at, uh, at, at picking a location and de developing a program need for a facility like this to determine what, what's the best value that we can get for the long-term investment they're gonna make in a project like this. When we talk about entertainment districts, uh, and this, this example that I'm showing to you here is, is a project that we, uh, our company was involved with a number of years ago in a, in a suburban market in, in, uh, in Texas, actually it's a suburban market outside of Dallas. And, and it's an entertainment district. And it was designed that way by a developer who basically encapsulated what a, in this particular case is 200 acres. Uh, this is a main thoroughfare that, that goes from uh, 
all the way through Texas up into Oklahoma. And this district was created with entertainment and retail in mind. Uh, there's a fairly substantial residential component here. This is the entertainment center that we developed. It's the Allen Event Center, uh, 500 fixed seat arena. It has a community ice sheet behind it. It has a conference center hotel next to it. Now, there's no, no casino, or it, it is a conference center hotel. Um, and then this is a, what they refer to as a Main Street corridor, which allows their place to have a real sense of, uh, of belonging, of being. It's, it's a place where people gather. On event days, the street is closed down. It's a festival area, uh, all congenial to this particular development here. Um, so it's the strategic partners in, in, in this kind of an endeavor and probably others uh, tend to be restaurants and bars. There's a sports bar right here. There's a steakhouse over on this side. There's the hotel, obviously, that is part of this, potentially a casino, a lot of retail and and. And in some cases, there's a residential component that is that can work synergistically with an overall concept. Rick, uh, I'd just like to mention that, uh, you know, in terms of Grand Prairie and just like every major city, hospital, airport, post-secondary institution, uh, lots of uh, uh, sub in or major industries driving the marketplace, oil and gas, of course, agriculture and a lot of legs in the community. So you really get uh, the components of a hub city and uh, the idea is to create a, a potential, like an, a new and exciting stream out of live and sports entertainment uh, in, a, in a district that uh, gathers all the components we saw on the previous page, hotel, casino, retail, and so on and so forth. These are the things that uh, I'm not telling you anything new, but we hear from city leaders. These are on the audit that people and businesses are saying they're checking those boxes when choosing a place to uh, invest and grow their, their business and stay for a long term so that people aren't always traveling out or seeking out. They can live, work, play in their own backyard. And, you know, when you look at Grand Prairie, a wonderful monster, new big hospital opening fantastic the airport and and so many other things college is growing yet it, it just says hub all over the place and uh so i'm not surprised that people in the in your neighborhood are looking at okay what do we do for sports and entertainment for the people that live here and live in the, in the north peace uh, area just like edmonton did on a different scale, but when we were talking about Rogers Place in the Ice District with city and gov uh, provincial government, so I thought it just plays itself out, and it, this is what city leaders are telling us. Um, I would go a little farther so that people in tax generation, these districts generate significant value in terms of all the all the uh, tax that's generated in Edmonton, we created a community revital or used the municipal government, the city used it to create a community revitalization levy, which uh, redirected the funds associated with education tax, as you know, I'm sure, uh, into the development of other uh, amenities in the neighborhood, not the arena and not the ice district, but in other amenities nearby. And uh, so as you continue to look for and find those things, there were, there were more uh, funds there for the city to use in different ways. So I, I don't run a municipal government, but uh, I understand that the, the revenue district in a good year, not 2020, but in a good year, the arena district attracted more than 2.2 million in its first year of paid visitors. And uh, so it was way over our guesstimate, lots, a lot bigger, at least 200,000 bigger than what we estimated for year one. Rick. Thank you. So a couple uh, examples that we have referred to in the beginning here, and this is one that Patrick and, and I worked, our respective companies worked closely uh, with, and it was municipality of Wood Buffalo in Fort McMurray. We were retained by the municipality to, pr to prepare a, um, a, 
a concept for a main street downtown development. Um, the challenge we had here is that the site was, a, was about three acres in a downtown core. Uh, the land that the city assembled was very expensive um, and, and it, it added a significant price tag to the project. Uh, that all happened after we were retained, or before we were retained. But in any event, what we did is we worked with the Northland Group, uh, the Glarty family uh, that owns the Sam Ann Inns, owns the Sharks Club Bar and Grill restaurants, Moxie's Chop and Denny's uh, to create a concept plan that would be about a 6,500 seat, uh, fixed seat arena uh, that would, what one we hoped, and Patrick was instrumental in pulling this together, uh, secure a Western Hockey League team, uh, and then have the Conference Center Hotel attached to the arena. So we had a Sharks Club Bar and Grill restaurant on the bottom, we had a link brought you from the bar and restaurant area and the hotel into the, the arena, which then also really made the conference center idea really work. So you could be in the hotel, you could have your meetings and your breakout spaces in the hotel, and you could have your mass gatherings in the arena, uh, which was exactly what the, the municipality were looking for. So these are just a couple of side views of what the facility was. The hotel was about 220 room uh, signature Sandman. And then they said it, it, it had a um, Sharksville Bar and Grill on the bottom floor that entered into the facility. So then we, we kind of give you some street shots of what this facility was looking like. The city, municipality, sorry, the municipality were looking for an iconic design. This is the second rendition of our facility. The first one was more, um, more a little bit more stoic. It was a brick facade facility and, and the municipality came back to us and said, we're looking for something that's more iconic we want something that maybe fits uh, the nature of our oil industry heritage. Um, so kind of along the lines almost of what you see at Rogers Place is that that uh, shiny design, the iconic design with a large video board on the outside. Um, and, and this was a you know a pretty neat project. Unfortunately, as Patrick said, we, we started the project uh, at a time when the oil prices were, I believe, 110 bucks a barrel. By the time we got to the referendum stage, uh, prices had dropped to about 50, 55 a barrel, and then the next year the fires hit. So timing was just not good for the municipality, obviously. Um, but um, we did a lot of work for them. Uh, we're compensated for our work, and and it's still there. It's it's an available option for them at at an opportune time. Uh, your your thoughts, Patrick? Um, I, uh, doing a lot of the. No, I think you covered it, Rick. I think we should, you know, give uh, in the interest of time, uh, move along. Okay. Quick snap. This that, is a, uh, a current one that we're Bruce Gentlemen, I Correct. appreciate I appreciate yeah, you're not getting any sort of visual is... feedback from us, um, but I uh, and I appreciate that you did see my message. Uh, if you could uh, attempt to sort of uh, bring it together for us uh, and uh, contextualize it, make it relevant okay. to Grand Prairie, uh, and we'd probably like to get to a point where council members would uh, have some questions for each of you. Yeah, we're mayor. We're just about two slides, and we're done here. So I appreciate that. And this is, again, this is a concept that's in Spruce Grove. It's an existing uh, development called the Westman Development off of Yellowhead Highway. We, we work for the city with Sierra Planning and Management. And Rick, we lost you there. Maybe I'll, uh, uh, if, it's, if you can hear me, Mayor, I'll just wrap. Uh, obviously, the organization has worked uh, on a number of sites and projects and, uh, and has a great deal of experience over 25 years of building, developing arenas for all kinds of municipalities, all about the same size as yours. And uh, we've, the industry group that talked to us, talked to us about industrial land that was available in the hospital area. Uh, that's interesting. I don't. I don't specifically know the piece of land or where it might be. I've spoken to Murray Taves from the AGHL Grand Prairie Storm about his interests. He was over the moon about it, and on and on. So I'd be happy to uh, work on a, a Q and A if there's something there. Please, uh, you and I have talked about this, Mayor Givens, uh, years ago, and so uh, there may be something new and fresh. The start is to do the survey work, just to start the study of 
what and how and where, and uh, and then start to move it around. That's the beginning of a data-driven decision process. Great, thanks very much, Mr. LaForge, and appreciate uh, both of you joining us um, uh, to, to give your expertise or to share it and uh, to answer maybe potentially some questions. Um, as you probably are aware, the City of Grand Prairie has a, a public process underway, an engagement process uh, specifically around um, Revolution Place, our existing facility. Uh, council has asked to have a discussion at budget time about whether or not we wish to reinvest in that facility. Uh, administration has been asked to bring forward, I guess, essentially two, op well, I suppose there's three options, don't do anything. Um, uh, a smaller renovation of a $4 million scale and a larger renovation of a $50 million, $40 to $50 million scale. So just for context, that's the discussion that's out in the community and you may get some questions uh, from council members sort of standing from that vantage point. Uh, but I will open up for questions for the delegation. I see Mr. LaForge is still there and uh, I'll just try to manage questions from here, Mr. LaForge. Uh, Councillor Clayton. Thanks, Mayor Gibbon. Uh, thanks for calling in today, gentlemen. I appreciate the proposal. I'm curious in regards to um, the actual tenant uh, of, of a hockey team. Tell me what that looks like. So. For example, a facility like this gets built in our community in the next, let's throw it a number, five to seven years. Uh, maybe it's quicker. Uh, as you know, we're a year away from election, so it takes some time. But uh, regardless, uh, what does it look like for getting a team? I know many teams across uh, yeah. you know, the world are, are maybe not in the best financial position. So, but are, are there currently teams available, and what does that look like? Well, it's, uh, I'm not a governor of the Western League anymore. Uh, however, I did speak to the commissioner of the Western League knowing that this meeting was coming up just to say, to give him a heads up that we were having this conversation because somehow it will get to eventually to the press. We're looking at doing this Western Hockey League grant. That is the league, I think, that works well. The nearest uh, team would be Edmonton. The second nearest team would be Prince George. But uh, the uh, buses, the teams go on the road and they stay on the road for four or five games at a time. So uh, there are teams that are uh, rumored to be financially wobbled, but it is not the league's way of doing things to give you a team and then hope you come up with a building. And uh, it actually, as a governor and somebody who wrote a lot of those policies, it actually is the other way around. Uh, where leagues uh, from the Western League to the National League um, uh, you know, they get excited after they see a pouring concrete and making a budget commitment to build a facility. So whether there's 10 for sale or two, um, there'll always be a team available for a great market and a good building. I can say that to you. We've never turned one down. Great. Thank you. Um, so if I, if I can, uh, there may be other questions, but uh, so just to be to put a fine point on it, it really is the the building is a prerequisite to even be considered as a location for a, one of the other sort of leagues. Yeah, is that correct? I, I, I would say, Mayor Gibbons, that the prerequisite is to have a great city or a great community. Check Grand Prairie qualifies. Uh, is it within the geographic zone of the Western Hockey League? Check uh, Grand Prairie qualifies. Uh, does it have a building? No. Uh, does it have lots of fans? Yes. And so if you go down the list, I didn't want to leave it at one thing. If you go down the list, everything but the building is there to qualify as a member. As a matter of fact, I think I, uh, you should know this. There's a number of people in your community that would be willing owners uh, of the franchise and would be very happy to participate in the pursuit of the franchise, as you may guess. And those people I've spoken to a number of times and uh, I've given them the same answer. Without a building, there's not much we uh, could pro hope to accomplish. But with plans for a building by a city a council, a commitment to it, now you're talking and it starts to move from there. I see Councillor Palatz in the queue. Uh, thanks, Mayor Gibbon. Thanks, uh, Patrick and Rick. It's been, I have, have, have had an opportunity to chat with you guys before, but it was the first time going through this presentation, so it was neat seeing some of the projects and scale that you guys have done. Um, I, a question for you guys though is just what sort of when you're talking a district because we are looking at Revolution Place downtown and I'm just trying to get my head around what, what sort of land size are you guys seeing 
this needing to be in, like when you've done these sort of facilities I, in the past? I, I don't, I really haven't seen much that's smaller than, it takes about four acres for the footprint of, uh, of a new arena. Uh, parking and everything included. And then from there, uh, I haven't seen anything less than 10 acres. And ideally you probably want 15 because to serve uh, your marketplace, my quick slide rule, 900 to 1,000 to a million people a year, um, you're gonna need hotel, casino. Those are two walls that you can sell on the building reduces the city's cost or the developer's cost and turns those walls into private tax generating businesses. And uh, then the retail and on and on and on that goes with it. Those are all opportunities that do not happen uh, in uh, rejuvenated city centers. They just don't. And uh, I can't say, I mean, there's a number of reasons why they haven't happened, but uh, even uh, in Toronto, where uh, Scotiabank Arena, where the Maple Leafs play, the old uh, post office underneath the Gardner, it, um, it hasn't generated a penny of new retail business because there's no place for it to go. And, uh, and, and that was probably the most likely uh, facility to ever generate. They, they do about 2.5 million people a year. And uh, there's been no, no development. You need the acreage to take advantage of the new growth and to generate new revenue streams. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Platt. Any other questions? No. Uh, I did have one. Uh, Mr. Forge, in your experience, um, a new development in that, you know, and, and I appreciate there's sort of a range there, sort of from your minimum four acre to preferably 15 acre, but. What's what's a development cost? You know, what what are you into by the time you are able to have anybody walk in and sit down in a building? For so a the green entertainment field? center, entertainment center itself, before you sell two walls, and plus or minus is a little under uh, hundred thousand a seat, so seven thousand seats, seven million dollars, and uh, but there's a way to reduce that in terms of co collaborating with stakeholders who are very interested being nearby to get it into the high 40s so i mean land everything included i don't know how much land costs but i'm sure it's lower than edmonton i, I shouldn't say that probably might be higher uh, uh but uh, that's kind of the range mayor given that's that's where you get you get to so hundred thousand dollars a seat less the collaborative uh partners that you can bring into the facility okay thank you any other questions doesn't look like we've uh, got any other questions in council chambers. Councillor Blackburn, I see you uh, shaking your head. No, thank you. Um, Ms. LaForge, thanks very much. And if you'll pass on our thanks to Rick as well for uh, taking the time to be here. Uh, certainly appreciate it, given the amount of discussion that this is going to get in the community as we head into our city budget. Thank you, council. It's been a pleasure. It's only a conversation so far, and it's been fun. I wish we were face-to-face, -face, but that's not going to happen for a few more months. Yeah. Of course. Thank course. you very much. Thanks, Mr. LaForge. Okay, so we'll move on. Uh, we had no other, uh, sorry, I'll just confirm we have nobody else that's uh, wishing to make a presentation to council in the open delegation session. I see administration saying that it uh, appears that there are none. Uh, we do have uh, scheduled delegations later this afternoon in our evening session. Uh, so we'll move on. Uh, we have no items of unfinished business and but we do have our added item of reports. Item 7.1 uh, CKC Advisory Committee. Uh, we're looking to make some public member appointments. Uh, the clerk emailed out a recommended motion. Uh, is there somebody who'd like to make that motion? I see Councillor Thiessen is in the queue. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Given. Uh, I guess I could make the first motion, and there's a second motion there as well. I can make them all if you like, but I would move that council appoint uh, Mr. Claude Bolton, uh, Mr. Alex Dawson, uh, Mr. Shea Guai, Guy for public member appointments to the CKC Advisor Committee, each for a term ending December 31st, 2021. Great. Thanks, Councillor Thiessen. Any discussion or debate on that motion? I don't see anybody in Council Chambers. I'll look to Councillor Blackburn. Any discussion or debate? Seeing none, then I will call for the vote in Council Chambers. Please vote. Thank you. That's eight votes cast. Councillor Blackburn, how do you vote? In favor. Thank you. 
And that motion carries unanimously. Uh, and I think we had a second motion ready to go. Yeah, I can council follow up with that. I would uh, move that council appoint Ms. Shannon Dunfield, Mr. Garrett Richardson, Mr. Ken Shep, and uh, Mr. Thomas Schlithka, and Mr. Joel Thibault for public member appointments to the CKC Advisory Committee, each for a two-year term ending December 31st, 2022. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, Councillor Thiessen. Any discussion or debate on that motion? I see Councillor Bressy. Great. Thank you, Mayor Given. I'll definitely be voting in support of this, but just an observation I'll make that I don't love about these appointments is that we've got one woman and a whole bunch of men that we're appointing to this committee right now. And I think that given the applications we had, we don't have, uh, I think that is just what it is today. But it is something that I'm kind of... Yeah. I'm kind of curious something I'd love to have further conversation about it, and I definitely want to put more thought is, is there something wrong with our application process that's leading to this or the way we've structured that? Because that's, that's concerning to me to see. So just an observation I'll make. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah thanks, Councillor Bressy. Uh, there are a number of other uh, seats still available on this committee, and so that could be uh, some effort that council members could make out in the community as we're publicizing the opportunity to, to put your name forward for this. Um, or that administration could do if they're uh, specifically targeting user groups, they could be looking at that uh, to try to balance that out a little bit from that perspective. Appreciate that observation. Um, I don't see any other uh, discussion or debate. Then I will call for the vote in council chambers. Please vote. Thank you. Councillor Blackburn, how do you vote? In favour. Thank you. And that motion carries unanimously as well. Um, and should take us to committee business and starting with item 8.1, the Infrastructure and Economic Development Committee, Councillor Bressy. Great. Thank you, Mayor Given. I would move the Council accept the minutes of the Infrastructure and Economic Development Committee meeting held Tuesday, September 29th, 2020, as presented. Okay. Thanks very much, Councillor Bressy. Any discussion or debate on that set of minutes? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote in Council Chambers. Please vote. Thank you. Councillor Blackburn, how do you vote? In favour. Thank you. That motion carries unanimously. Councillor Bressy, anything you wanted to highlight? Yeah, thank you. There's no business coming from that committee, but a few updates for Council is from a Director of Service Area update. We heard about 430 trees that are being planted through the community, which is exciting, and especially since the majority of those are going to Hillside. And so I'm glad to see the city moving forward with commitments to improve that neighbourhood that came with the area redevelopment plan that was passed on it several years ago. I think that's going to be a lot nicer neighborhood to walk through once those trees grow and they're mature. We had an update on the city's safe roads to school strategy that was adopted before this council term. So it was great hearing some of the efforts that have been taken in the city to help kids get to school safely. And some direction that committee gave to administration was to come back with a capital plan to close all of the active transportation links which are on city-owned land, just making sure that kids and other people who are using our paths and our sidewalks can get where they need to go without ever having to walk on a road or walk through mud because there's no sidewalk where there should be a sidewalk, so that was exciting. And then something else that committee gave direction for is just doing, asking administration to do some work planning for our downtown phase four next next year and make sure that as we close down a few blocks of that blocks of the core that we're doing a good job make sure that businesses still have customer access to them and that we're helping them get the traffic they need to get to stay afloat throughout that project and after a hard year and so that's a plan that we'll be hearing about in the next month or two so that we can make sure that we're putting appropriate money towards it a budget when it comes to be budget time great thanks very much Councillor Bressy. That'll take us on to the Community Services Committee and Councillor Friesen. Thank you, having trouble with my button there. Um, so I would like to move that uh, Council adopt the minutes of the Community Services Committee meeting held Tuesday, September 29th, 2020, as presented. Okay, thanks very much, Councillor Friesen. Any discussion or debate on that set of minutes? Seeing none, then I will call for the vote in council chambers. Please vote. Thank you. Councillor Blackburn, how do you vote? In favor. Thank you. That motion carries unanimously. Councillor Friesen. 
Thank you, Mayor Given. So there is some uh, business arising out of that meeting. I would like to uh, recommend that Council approve the emergency community group funding in the amount of $15,000 from Council's Strate Strategic Initiatives Fund, and that's for the Wolverines Wheelchair Sport Association. Thanks very much, Councillor Friesen. Uh, discussion and debate on that motion? Seeing none, then I will call for the vote uh, in council chambers. Please vote. Thank you. And Councillor Blackburn, how do you vote? In favor. Thank you. That motion carries unanimously. Councillor Friesen. Thank you. Uh, there's another one before us that uh, I recommend that council approve amendments to the community group funding policy, which is policy 315, and receive the community group funding guidelines, which is Procedure 315-1 for information. Thanks, Councillor Friesen. Any discussion or debate on this recommendation? Again, seeing none in Council Chambers or on Zoom, then I will call for the vote in Council Chambers. Please vote. Thank you. Councillor Blackburn, how do you vote? In favour. Thank you. That motion carries. Councillor Friesen. Thank you. Uh, lastly, I would like to recommend that Council approve the Neighbourhood Association policy as presented. Thanks very much, Councillor Friesen. Any discussion or debate on that motion? Seeing none, then I will call for the vote in Council Chambers. Please vote. Thank you. Councillor Blackburn, how do you vote? In favour. Thank you. That motion carries unanimously as well. Uh, anything you wanted to highlight from that set of minutes, Councillor Friesen? Uh, thank you, Mayor Given. Yes, I'd kind of like to let the community know what we've just done here. So the uh, emergency community group funding is going to assist the World Wolverines Wheelchair Sports Association to continue its good work in our community. And uh, many of our community groups have been impacted by um, the, the COVID in the last several months and uh, this is one that uh, it will uh, benefit from a little extra help that we can give through our strategic initiatives fund. Regarding the community group funding policies review, this is going to pave the way for our community groups to have more sustainable funding rather than having to come back uh, every year and ask for funding again. We, uh, Council will be able to um, provide of a four-year look ahead for funding. Um, now, if things change for community groups in that four years compared to what they had initially asked for or felt that they needed, they do have the opportunity to come back to council. So it's not that that's all they get, but it certainly will go a long way in providing that sustainability and uh, reassurance for community groups with um, significantly less work for both the groups, which are um, tasked with really big um, uh, big application processes, and it'll also reduce the work on administration. And uh, the neighborhood associations, that, uh, that um, policy paves the way for the, well, it, it, um, it helps the associations understand what it is that council expects or, or prefers to see happen out of our neighborhood associations. But the other thing it does is gives, um, gives the way for these groups to be able to meet together. So kind of um, an association of associations, if you will. And, uh, and that's always important. It's great to know what's going on in your own neighborhood, but to be able to meet with other neighborhoods and understand what's going on there and, and uh, share ideas as well is a pretty cool thing. So that's what those are all about. And uh, just a couple other quick things. Um, the uh, outdoor pool has closed. That uh, The private bookings there was really well received and um, over 82,000 guests were um, took advantage of it including 1,500 guests who were able to enjoy the, or sorry, 1,500 separate guests who were able to enjoy the pool through the Big Brothers and Big Sisters Partnership Program. And that was made possible through the Don Gillies Legacy Fund. So all things considered, our, uh, even with the limitations that COVID placed on us, our outdoor pool was a, was a success this uh, past summer. And uh, with um, 
the uh, events and entertainment, the Caribbean Association hosted a fashion show in celebration with Culture Days at Teresa Sargent Hall, um, which went really well. The Monster Energy Professional Bull Riders, that upcoming tour has dates moved to November 5th to 7th, and the arenas cl will be actually a closed TV set, um, but TSN is recording the show and it will be broadcast uh, internationally, so that's pretty cool. There's um, three PBR segments that are going to run. Um, uh, that's, I think, the the highlights. Oh, Folk Tales Tour. Yeah, I did want to mention that as well. The annual Heritage Folk Tales Tour down at the museum is upcoming, so make sure to get your tickets for that and attend. Quite an exciting evening. Thanks. Great. Thanks very much, Councillor Friesen. Uh, we'll move on to the Corporate Services Committee and Councillor Minhas. Thank you, Madam Mayor Given. Uh, I move the Council adopt the minutes of the Corporate Services Committee meeting held on Tuesday, September 29, 2020, as presented. Thanks very much, Councillor Minhas. Any discussion or debate on that set of minutes? And seeing none, then I will call for the vote in Council Chambers. Please vote. Thank you. And Councillor Blackburn, how do you vote? In favor. Thank you. That motion carries unanimously. Uh, Councillor uh, Minhas, anything you want to highlight from that? Yeah, I've got a couple items to say that. Uh, that finance, the line of the credit line has been re reduced to 35 million to 10 million. This has not been drawn from the administration, has no plan to use it before it expirations on uh, December 31st. Administration has confirmed that Minister of Transportation City intend to access IC, I, ICIP COVID this reasonable stream, I can say that. Communication and marketing administration continue to support both of the revolution place and budget opportunity that are going on. That's about it from my report. Great. Thank you very much, Councillor Minhas. Uh, we'll move on to the Protective and Social Services Committee. Councillor Plot. Uh, thanks, Mayor Gibbon. I just make a motion that we uh, approve the minutes of the Protective and Social Services Committee held Tuesday, September 2029, uh, 2020. Thanks very much, Councillor Plot. <laughs> Any, any discussion or debate on that set of minutes? Any errors or omissions we need to correct before we adopt them? Seeing none, then I will call for the vote. Uh, in Council Chambers, please vote. Thank you. Councillor Blackburn, how do you vote? In favour. Thank you. That motion carries unanimously. Councillor Plot, anything you want to highlight from that set of minutes? Yeah, thanks, Mayor Gibbon. Um, we had a delegation come, Mr. Lenoger come, um, and we had some conversation about uh, a letter that was brought forward from our cab association. And so we did, we uh, are going to be sending administration with a little bit of work as we're going to be looking at putting a draft together for a scope of work regarding an in Indigenous liaison worker. Uh, so it was a good conversation about it. Sounds like it's potentially a need that we have in the community, and I'm looking forward to seeing the scope of work come back. Um, we had Ms. Wendy Hughes redo us a verbal update on a few things and a couple highlights where the enforcement services has dedicated officers that are assigned to address issues regarding the homelessness in downtown uh, area. So they'll be working along with, with the Mobile Outreach Centre as well, their outreach program. Um, the program has been working with Rotor House to address the encampments near the property. The community response has been well received thus far. Um, RCMP, the alert team, seized a substantial amount of drugs and cash recently. 33 charges were laid against eight individuals. So that's always good news to hear. And with that, that's our report. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, Councillor Palat. Um, I think that handles all of our committee business and takes us into correspondence. Uh, sorry. Yes, handles all of our committee business and takes us into correspondence. We do have one uh, letter of correspondence in response to a uh, council motion from some time ago. You'll see in your agendas um, a letter from the Minister of Municipal Affairs, our MLA, Tracy Allard. Um, the minister was responding to our motion um, that council passed uh, earlier this summer requesting a discussion, a uh, cross-ministry discussion, uh, with respect to provincial municipal partnerships and uh, we had identified a number of different ways that we we're already working with the province um, in a number of different sectors 
Um, as you read the letter, you may uh, feel that it somewhat misses the point of our of our request. And I would say that uh, it was sent off just in the uh, transition as the minister was coming into her office. And so I think she sort of picked up the response or her department did. Um, and they may have missed the fact that we weren't exactly asking for funding. Uh, I've followed up directly uh, with the minister's chief of staff who uh, appreciated uh, that follow-up and has since offered uh, that we could work with the ministry to set up a meeting to have the kind of discussion that we were intending to have in the first place. Uh, Mr. Bork, I think you've been in touch with the department as well. Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Mayor Given. We seem to have uh, tripped up the system by uh, identifying a problem and not asking for uh, for funding. Um, but we uh, have been in, uh, following up your discussion with uh, Minister Allard's Chief of Staff. We have had uh, some other further discussions on timing, and uh, we uh, were very close to a date near the end of the month to have a, a meeting as we uh, originally requested. Okay, that's great. Thanks very much, Mr. Bork. So um, I would look for a motion to receive this uh, correspondence for information um, or any other actions. Councillor Bressy. Great. I just appreciate the work that yourself and our staff have done as well as the minister the minister and her staff make sure that this meeting happens. So glad to, glad to get that context. And with that, I'd move that we receive this letter for information. That's great. Thanks very much, Councillor Bressy. Any other discussion or debate? Seeing none, then I will call for the vote. Uh, in council chambers, please vote. One more, and there we go. There's my eight votes in council chambers. Councillor Blackburn, how do you vote? In favor. Thank you. And so that motion carries unanimously. Um, I think uh, before we get to our scheduled recess, uh, we do have uh, delegation business from the first half. Uh, I think a motion to receive that presentation for information would probably be in order. Councillor Thiessen. Uh, so moved, Mayor Given. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Thiessen. Any discussion or debate on that motion? Again, seeing none through all the plexiglass in Council Chambers, uh, I will call for the vote. Uh, please vote in Council Chambers. Thank you. Councillor Blackburn, how do you vote? In favor. Thank you. That motion carries unanimously. Uh, that handles, uh, we have no notices of motion this afternoon, so that handles all the business for our afternoon session. We will reconvene uh, for our scheduled delegations and public hearings at 6 p.m. We'll see everyone back then. Thank you.